We're here to answer your game, gaming, and game night questions. So yesterday, when I sat down to work on the show notes for the show, it was the first day of school here in Ontario for high schools and grade schools. And I thought it would be a good time to cover one of the various school gaming questions we've saved up over the last couple of years for obvious reasons. With most kids actually heading back in person, I fear it was probably worth dusting on of these older questions off now that they're applicable yet again. Tonight's question comes from tabletop bellhop patron Yuho Rutila, who writes, I was tasked to run a board game session for one hour in a school event. There were six players from first grade to fourth grade, and I had no idea how much they have played before. What kinds of games would you make them play? Would you try cramming lots of games into one hour or one longer game? How much help should you give these kids playing against each other? I ended up running My Little Scythe, and we got through it just in one hour, thanks to my daughter, who knew how to win fast enough, <laughs> and all the players were in the same game. They were quiet, but that might be mostly because no they didn't know me personally. I tried to give them hints by reminding them of rules in certain situations that fit into their playing position. Well, thanks so much for the great question and support of the show, Yuho. I also want to thank you for taking the initiative to game with kids in school. Hopefully you weren't forced to do this. You kind of volunteered for it. But I think gaming is a great educational and social tool that I wish more schools utilized. Indeed, I think many schools are still stuck in the Milton Bradley roll and move mindset. And aside from some games you can pick up at Scholar's Choice and other teacher oriented educational stores, they may just not be aware of the wealth of fun and educational opportunities in the board game hobby. So before we dive into actual recommendations of the kind of games I would bring to an event like this, I want to discuss a few things. So first off, I want to point some people to some of our older content. Um, for example, I have an article called Raising the Next Generation of Tabletop Gamers that talks about how to start gaming with kids. And episode 39 of our podcast called The Next Generation, which also talks about gaming with kids. Then there's another article called Some of the Best Kids Board Games and How to Get Your Kids to Play Them which has some great tips to get kids excited about gaming, which again was talked about on our podcast, this time episode 20, which was called Child's Play, part number two. And also you can jump onto the blog in the search and just type kids games and you'll have all kinds of articles about kid games. We've talked about kids games many times, basically going from my own personal experience, raising a couple of young gamers who are now ones into high school as of yesterday and the other ones finishing up grade school pretty soon. So we do have a back catalog on this topic and I do encourage people to check it out now so you don't lose you for the whole thing. We are going to cover some of the key aspects that were mentioned in those previous episodes tonight. So the first of that is all kids are different. What's easy for one kid could be difficult for another, and often that has nothing to do with age. Due to this, you should always have multiple options available and backup plans for when things go south. Realize that every kid showing up is going to be different from every other kid, and not all kids are the same, and a game that works for one won't necessarily work for another. Yeah, and this can be so important for the, those larger group events even compared to this one uh, with only a few kids. That one game or even one type of game that you ha might have several of mm -hmm. might not be right for all who show up and you don't want them tuning out and just drifting off into some other <laughs> thought process. <laughs> yep. Also, remember, games are meant to be fun. But remember that more than usual, right? Like, like this is especially true when playing with kids, especially in grade school, looking at the earlier grades. Don't worry about being strict and stringent with the rules. We don't want rule lawyers here, at least the first few sessions. As long as the kids are having fun, let them run with whatever they're doing, which may be something very far from the actual rules of the game. Don't try to enforce structured play right away, especially with younger kids. If they just want to crack open animal upon animal and dump the meeples on the floor and play around with them as animals, all the power to them. And in that same vein, watch out for kids who are rules lawyers. Yes. Kids whose parents might be gamers and they may be already familiar with some of these games. If everyone is having fun, don't let one of the, that one kid who knows this game and, and has played it a thousand times ruin it for the others who may not know or even care about it explain to that kid why you're doing what you're doing mm -hmm. and why it's okay to be doing whatever it may be, even if that's not in the rules. 
So I, I kind of feel some of that might have been directed at my kids. <laughs> John has a game with them. But we have had this problem with my kids because we have taught the kids a variety of games. And I will admit my oldest, when she shows up to a gaming event, if the kids aren't playing right, she's like, no, that's not how you play. So we did have to sit down and talk to her about that. Uh, the thing is, too, is is help them out with the rules, right? You you want to you want to be part of it and make sure they're having fun, but like, don't force it right away. Like, like eventually you'll get there, because this is being done at a school, right? So you want it to be fun, you want it to be fun in games, but you also want it to be a learning experience. Here you have a chance to mold, to teach lessons of sportsmanship, being a gracious winner and not being a poor loser, taking turns properly, working together and cooperating, and playing with structure especially for young kids they're used to just free form imaginative play this is a way to slowly introduce structured play if this is going to be a recurring event what i would do is slowly add in the rules right like the first night everyone's just having fun playing with the peace lawns everyone's having fun great maybe you play a game in the corner for the kids that want to take it seriously but then the next time you're like oh now that you're playing with the animals how about you try to start stacking them? let's see who can stack them higher and then the next time you play okay now we're going to roll the die and everyone's going to sorry everyone's going to get their own animals and we're going to roll the die to see who places what and then eventually teach them the full rules right teach that structure as time goes on let them play with the the components first ending with everyone playing the games by the book yeah, we talk about video game tutorials all the time and how more board games should look to them for inspiration. You can make that happen if you add the rules or parts of the game mm -hmm. week by week or, or, or bit by bit, depending on how often you're doing this or how much time you have. Now, you also asked about um, teaching the games and helping the kids. Definitely help, like, like especially at the start. Go in, teach them how to play, take turns for them, but don't take away their agency. That is one of the biggest things that parents have a habit of doing to kids that it's I don't, I don't know in a way is harmful i'll use the term harmful no i am not a child psychologist nor an educator but you want kids to have their own agency so yes tell them what the proper rule is and tell them like if they're going to make a bad move maybe you stop them and say well you might not want to do that and this is why but if you want to see what happens for doing that feel free so don't take away the agency but you do want to coach and guide absolutely so now, uh, no yep yeah, sorry so as for Yuho's question about one long game or multiple short ones, personally, I'd go for short ones that can be played multiple rounds and still be fun. Saving longer, more complicated games, like My Little Scythe, um, that wouldn't have even been on my radar. For, uh, for a later event, when everyone has more experience and is more comfortable with each other and are now past that point of, of just goofing around and having fun and sitting down and playing games. Because I think that way... You want to play one of those games, like you play it and you get that again and you play again and again and get that to fill an hour. I think it's going to be way more satisfying for more kids. Plus, it's there's gaps in between so people can leave. So if a kid does get bored or they're not having fun or maybe they lost and they're having a hard time handling that or there's a kid who won who's just going around being a little crazy about the fact they won the game and make fun of the kids. There's, there's a break there between the games. Whereas if you're playing one long game, you don't have that chance for people to back out. So I strongly recommend multiple shorter ones until your group's well established yeah and, and also it's really good to have flexible length games like mm -hmm. code games duet or other party style games with loose or limited scoring that can yes. be a real blessing in uh, situations like this yeah. especially when you're getting down to that end and you want to get some more time you've got some more time but not maybe enough to get a full game of x mm -hmm. and y in throw code names down and you're good to go now, what I'm not sure on, and this is, this is I, I, I just have my experience as a parent myself. Again, I'm not an educator or a child psychologist or anything, is I actually don't know what you should do for availability of choice. Like, as someone who hosts public play events, if, if I'm thinking of a gaming event at a local game store with kids attending, I want to have a few different games for the kids to pick from. Like, I, I want variety. Every time I go to the game store to run an event, I bring 10 times, well, not 10, maybe five times more games than I need. And I know I'm not going to get them all played, but they're there in case anyone wants to play them or in case we change their mind. And that's how I, and my immediate response is, I want to bring a pile of like five, six games and let the kids pick. But I can totally see this being a problem with kids because you're going to have some kids that want to play that one and some that want to play that one. And someone's going to have bad feelings if we don't play the game they wanted to play. And I could see that leading to arguments and hurt feelings. So I don't know the proper answer here. Like uh, Yuho is obviously in an educational environment. Maybe he'd know better. Like maybe start off with no options. Like the first game night, we're just going to sit together and play something very light and easy. Maybe a card game, maybe even something like Uno, just to get everyone playing together and get to know their names. And then maybe as you start playing, 
more games, bring two games the next week and let people vote or or decide, let the kids decide, hey, next week we're going to play this or that. What do you all want to play or something like that? So I have to say for me, uh, going in with a firm plan is the better option. Again, I'm not an educator or a child psychologist either, but for me, my, my gut tells me going with a plan and introducing several games to the kids one at a time, letting them get a feel for them, learn them, and then only once they understand a few of these games, then if you're getting the vibe that things aren't going to go south, yeah. then let the voting sort uh, happen. Now, if you're the teacher or have a teacher available, that person is often able to help out with some of the group dynamics. Right. And they're going to be quicker to catch that one student who's going to be isolated or getting isolated by the group. And they may even already know how these cliques pay, play out. And you can sort of steer around, uh, you know, kids getting left out. Yep. Very fair. As for player count, one game everyone can play is great but probably isn't going to be feasible, especially once you get beyond six players. Now, the problem with multiple games is you need someone to, to moderate each game. Uh, assuming Yuho is the only adult supervising here, there's just one teacher there. That could be a problem, at least at first. Now, shortly after the first session, if I was the one running this event, I would be looking for the stando kids, the ones who seem to be good at game teachers, the ones who pick it up right away, or the ones that actually knew the game before the event started. And then I would try to work with them so that they can act independently and take a group of their own to play the game. Until then, you're probably going to be stuck with one big group, which will limit you as far as game selection. Now, something else you can do is have, um, no, never mind. We're good. Now, now, multiple copies of a game here could be a lifesaver or games that can accommodate teams or large groups to work yeah. with at the beginning and then break off into those groups once that's rolling to learn other player uh, learn ga other games with smaller player counts. Yeah, the other thing you can do too is team up, team up kids so that you have a a smaller like you're playing a small player count game, but with more people than it's required on the box, right? You don't have to listen to the player count on the box. Uh, what I would recommend is teaming up an older kid with a younger kid, right? And have it so that the one can guide the other. And the younger kid moves the pieces on the board and does the things, but the older kid helps with decisions or something like that. That is a great way to make a small player count game accommodate a larger group. So those were the main things I thought of stuff we brought up in the past, maybe some new stuff mixed in here. Do you have anything else you wanted to add in? No, I think that that pretty much uh, gets us a good place to start. All right, well, let's move on to some game suggestions. These are some games that we think could be great for a grade school mm -hmm. board game event. And due to the fact that we're dealing with a grade school and dealing with kids from grade one up to grade five or six in some areas and up to grade eight in others, we put these games into groups based on things like the skills required to play. Mm -hmm. We're going to start off with cooperative games. Cooperative games are perfect for these kinds of events because they let the kids work together to win and avoid any issues due to competition. Everyone wins or loses. Cooperative games also have the advantage that shy or uncomfortable kids can fade into the background and the adults or adult uh, and the adult or adults can help without giving the player they are helping any advantage over the mm -hmm. others. They also let the younger kids play with the older kids all in the same game. And when we start talking about cooperative kid games on the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, you know that my number one recommendation is always going to be Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters, which now that I finally have it, gets even better with the Creepy Cellar expansion. Now, the only disadvantage of this ghost hunting game is that it only plays four players. So you might want more than one copy of the game or break off into teams with multiple players controlling each character. Maybe one player making the moves, the other making the decision. Or you have helpers, someone who flips the ghost cards. Like, if you need to throw in, like, if you need a fifth player, just have one player play the ghosts. All they do is flip the cards and put the ghosts out. Trust me, a kid will love doing that just being able to put the spooks out and then they're going to feel like they win if the other players lose. And it almost turns the game into a one versus many game. This is a fantastic, it's a roll and move game, still good despite it, great components. The only thing I would recommend is you actually try to find the actual version of Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters just because there is an expansion. There is also a Ghostbusters version, but the production quality is not as good. Though if you got some Ghostbuster fanatics in your classroom, maybe you should consider that one as well. And that was Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters. Next, I have Robot Turtles. 
This is an excellent STEM programming game, perfect for a school setting. Now, again, this only comes with enough turtles for four players, but there's no reason multiple kids can't work together to code one robot, right? This is the red turtle team and the yellow turtle team and the blue turtle team. While it's more work on the part of the person running the event, the best part about this game is making up your own programs and scenarios. In a school atmosphere, I can actually see making this game huge. What I would probably do is use it as like a source book. And I would get the rules and I'd read them and I'd look at the boards, but then I would make a school version. I would put a huge grid either on the floor or up on the board. And then I'd make my own versions of the cards and then set up rally races and battle royals and things where a whole classroom can play. Using this as, as a, a, a bridge to bring the game to way more than is in the box. I think this would be a fantastic teaching tool. And back when I was learning logo in school, having something like this would have been fantastic. Absolutely. And that was Robot Turtles. Now, finally, I have Flashpoint Fire Rescue. Now, I don't know if this has changed, but when I was a kid, a whole bunch of us wanted to be firemen. Like we visited the fire station and firemen came and there was Sparky, the fire dog. And like, like being a fireman just seemed like the coolest job ever. And Flashpoint lets kids do that. This game has the advantage of playing six players out of the box with an expansion that lets you add more. Now, the only concern I have with this game, because it's simple enough, there are family rules and complicated rules, so you can even have, like, the table of younger kids playing with one set of rules and the table with older kids diving all the way in. My only concern is the fact that you are dealing with a burning building, and yes, it's abstracted, like you're just pulling tokens out, but it is possible, you know, that grandma gets caught in the fire. So this could be traumatic, especially if you have a kid who's lived through a real fire. So this would be very dependent on knowing the kids you're playing with. And that was Flashpoint Fire Rescue. Now, other cooperative games that could be great for a one-hour grade school event include Outfoxed, Quirky Circuits, The Mind, Slide Quest, Talisman Legendary Tales, and Castle Panic. Mm -hmm. Next up, we have Dexterity Games. Anyone who has listened to this show for any amount of time <laughs> knows the Bellhop's a big fan of Dexterity Games. The great thing about Dexterity games is their accessibility. They don't require you to know anything about them before you play. Mm -hmm. Not having to know what trick taking is, no reading required, and they are very easy to teach. They are also great for kids of all ages, and often, found, and often it's found that for many of them, kids are better at them than the adults. Yes. So my first Dexterity game recommendation is Go Cuckoo. I know we mentioned this game a lot, but it's really that good. This is a simple dexterity game that kids of all ages can play. I played this one with preschoolers. The only issue I see with this one is it is not a high player count game. So you're probably going to want multiple copies of this game or other games available besides just Go Cuckoo. But I also recommend just have this one available so that when kids are playing other games if there's a kid that looks bored they can just kind of go play with it like this is just a good one just to have an event like this to kind of fill the gaps between games or if you're playing a game of player elimination it gives the kids that were eliminated something to play this game is so simple you can basically teach anyone to play it great components and kids are going to love building that giant nest and when things fall and the sound like that's one of the things i don't even know if we mentioned in our reviews the sound of that egg falling into the tin is just such a great sound to hear. And that was Go Cuckoo. All right, next, pitch car. Imagine the look on a group of kids' eyes. We got the door closed, and they show up, and they open the door to the, the classroom, and here is a racetrack running all over the room. That's the kind of thing you can set up with pitch car. Potentially, even having things like ramps going up onto desks and bridges across things and going up and around things. I am a huge fan of this flicking game that I find works great with all ages. Now, one tip, I don't remember who I first learned this from, but some podcasts I listened to suggested is with younger kids, they get two flicks for everyone else's one flick. That is until they get the hang of it, because I find flicking is a skill that you can learn at a pretty young age. Although if you're going to wrap a racetrack around a classroom, you might need a sponsorship from mm -hmm. the company in order to afford that much track. Yeah, <laughs> Pitch Car is not a cheap game, but if you are an educator, hopefully you have a budget for things like this. There you go. And that was Pitch Car. 
All right, let's reduce the price down to something I, I wouldn't say dirt cheap, but very reasonably priced, and that is Animal Upon Animal from Haba. There are a ton of different versions of this game out there, but they're all reasonably priced. And with a little rule tweaking, they're technically meant to be standalone, but you can combine them into one massive game. Though I think with kids, due to things falling down pretty regularly, you're actually better off just kind of having multiple sets out. And I can totally see this being a thing that would attract different groups of kids. Where you have, you know, the, 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 the um, there's one with like unicorn version and then there's a race car version and there's an animal version and you can have them all out. And that way, if, you know, the little boy's into unicorns, he runs over there and the little girl wants to sack some race cars, she can go over there. And then the other one goes over and plays with the, the animals and you can just set all, all the different sets. The other thing that's great with this one too is getting into that imaginative play where, this is a game that's fun to play with, even if you're not playing the game. So it's a great one to have for especially at the grade one, grade twos, where they might just like put them in a corner with animal upon animal and let them do their own thing. And that was animal upon animal. Other games in this uh, genre include Riff Raff, Hamster Roll, the classic Jenga, which is often in a lot of classrooms yeah. already, and Rhino Hero. Now, while some kids like to work together, Others thrive when there's competition. These are some great competitive games that we think a kid in grade school setting will enjoy. All right, first off is Hey, That's My Fish. This is one of my kids' favorite games growing up that they still enjoy playing to this that day. My youngest actually got into this at a really young age and picked up all the rules very quickly. Sure, she didn't really get to take that aspect of the game and cutting people off, but she still loved the game and was able to play it. This is another one where I actually recommend you buy multiple sets and just make a huge iceberg with multiple players to play over or split into groups where you each have to have your own little section. Now, one thing I would personally do is this has been reprinted a number of times. And for some reason, I will never understand. Every time a new printing comes out, they change what the penguins are. One time there are meeples, another time there are standees, another time there are actually like full 3D plastic penguins. So if I was going to buy multiple copies, I'd actually try to get like one from each printing. So that way you can just throw in all different types of penguins. So you're the wood team and you're the plastic team and you're the standee team. I think this game could get fantastic. If you go online, you can find maps just for the other one. But like you can make a massive board and be able to play with a ton of people if you have the pieces to do so. And that was, hey, that's my fish. Now, Deanna suggested I put this next one on the list due to how often she's played it with our kids and how much they enjoyed it and how young they started, and that is Quirkle. Now, this is mostly a pattern matching game. And to be honest, what I would do when first introducing Quirkle to a group, especially one that's so much younger, is I would just leave it as a pattern matching game. I wouldn't teach them all the rules. I'd just be like, you have your tiles, you put them on the pattern following the rule that they have to match either the color or the shape, not both and that you can't have the same things in the same row, right? That's it. Just a way to kind of play, and then slowly add in scoring. Maybe you just get one point for every one you put in. And then start adding the limitations, where you can only have one of each shape in a row. And then maybe add in the quirkle roll, where you get 15 bonus points if you manage to get all the shapes or all the colors in a row. Now, this is another one where you could buy multiple sets and combine them. In this case, I would just recommend having more than one copy for more than one group to be able to play at once. Because by throwing in extra sets, you actually kind of throw off the balance of because there's a set number of each type in there. The other thing that I would consider is Quirkle Cubes because it's a little more forgiving. And kids love rolling dice. So it takes Quirkle and it gives you dice. And if you don't have a good move, you can always roll to see if you get a better pattern. Now, another bonus to this game that doesn't apply to many of the games we mentioned tonight is nice, solid, chunky wooden pieces. And if messy hands get involved in this game, it's easy to clean up. And that was Quirkle. Now, my final game I want to highlight for competitive games is Magic Labyrinth. Now, kids, I don't know, of all ages seem to be fascinated by magnets. I was fascinated by magnets. My youngest daughter loves magnets, is fascinated by magnets. I know I was. This is a game that has players moving through an invisible maze trying to collect magic ingredients. You basically draw a magic ingredient on a bag and you put it on the board in a spot and the first person there claims it. Whoever claims, yeah, I think it's three ingredients first wins. The whole thing that you don't see unless you set up the game is there is a wooden maze on the other side, the bottom of the board, 
and you're actually using your piece as a magnet with a ball on the bottom of it, and you're actually moving it. So you have little invisible walls you can feel yourself hitting, which is really neat. Note also these magnets are in large wooden ponds that are pretty much impossible to swallow. Now, the big downfall of this game, though, is it only plays four players. But games are quick, so you could work, um, like, just play multiple games where different players take turns. Or, again, you could work in teams, though this one's a little hard one. Like, I think you're just going to argue, do we go this way or that? But with a team, maybe someone will be better at memorizing the maze than someone else. Like, oh, no, no, don't go that way. Remember, you hit a wall. So I could see it working with teams. This one is just, it's the magnet aspect. It's the, the toy horrificness of the game and the neatness of the first time you go to move a piece and hit a wall. This game just like, oh, that's so cool. Although I, every time I hear someone say it's almost impossible to swallow, I think that sounds like a challenge. <laughs> Don't say that to the kids. <laughs> and that was The Magic Labyrinth. Others on this uh, genre include Blockus, Monster Factory, Looney Quest, in ingenious king me and katan jr mm -hmm. now one of the issues you run into at a event um running an event kids could have uh, for kids you could have kids from early grades attending that is those younger kids who may not be able to read mm -hmm. due to this when making this list we pulled out the games that do require reading and put them in their own category now these may work with younger kids with some help or if paired up with a partner who can read. So if you're looking for a game that plays big groups and can get absolutely everyone laughing, take a look at Telestrations. Now, we've mentioned this before. I think most people know the game, but it's a formalized version of the telephone game where players draw something based on a clue, then pass the drawing to the next player who then has to guess what it is. Then that gets passed to the next kid who draws what the last player guessed. Now, what I would do in a school version of this is I would make sure first off to pick up the party pack version because I need to play 12 players or have multiple copies. And then I would make up my old clue list. I wouldn't use the cards that are in Telestration. I would, for one, make sure they're more kid friendly and don't include like movies the kids probably have never heard of. But then I would actually add in things that are based on the kids themselves and what they know, what they're into, possibly even tied into current lesson plans. If they're taking certain things in history or if it happens to be, you know, Black History Month, tying that in or even things like the school mascot or local sports teams. I would basically localize Telestration for, for my classroom. And that was Telestrations. Next, I have the Codenames series of games. Now, we've mentioned Codenames on the show many times, and I'd still say our personal preference is for Duet. I think playing with grade school kids, it's really going to matter which kids you're playing with, what your group's like, for which game works better. Basically, if your kids like being on teams and working together, you're going to look at duet. But if you like, if they like the competitive, you got a bunch of competitive kids and they're interested in doing whatever the old kids versus the young kids or the teachers versus the kids or something like that, you're going to look at code names. Now, what I would do is make sure you match up the teams so that you have a good mix of people. So that you don't have the young kids with the old kids, because the old kids are just going to destroy someone playing code names. They just have a better, in general, have a better vocabulary. You want to mix everyone up, right? So you've got younger kids working with older kids for both giving the clues and stuff like that. You may also want to make it so that in, in the full code names, maybe the teacher is the one that gives the clues at first until they've learned the game. Now, if Codenames is a bit there on the advanced side, I don't know if I could properly teach a one-year-old how to play Codenames. There are other versions. There's Codename Pictures, which just uses pictures to point at. There is Codenames Disney and Codenames Marvel that you may want to look at. Now, personally, I thought Disney was a little too simplified. But again, if your group's like grade fours and under, you're probably great with Codenames Disney because it uses pictures. It doesn't use words. Now, Marvel could be fantastic. But if you've got a kid there who's never seen a Marvel movie or never read the comics, they're basically not going to be able to play. So uh, I really think you're stuck in with the with the pitcher with pitchers duet and and basic code names in that case. Right. And that was the code name series of games. Finally, I have King of Tokyo. What kid does not love giant monsters, especially when one's like a giant penguin and another's a mecha cat and one's like a bunny controlling a mech suit? King of Tokyo is a King of the Hill themed dice game. Seems like it'd be great for all ages. And I almost always want to recommend this one because like, what are great kids games? And I totally forget that you get power points that you use to buy cards and you definitely need to be able to read those to be able to play this game. So this one is recommended for older kids. Though, again, you could pair up a non-reader with a reader to be able to play this game. What I do love about this game is its higher player count makes it great for big groups. 
though the one thing to be aware of is there is player elimination. So this is where I recommend you have that copy of Go Cuckoo available so the eliminated players can go play that while the game finishes up. And that was King of Tokyo. Other great games that require the kids to read include Stuffed Fables, Forbidden Island, Woodlands, and Disney Villainous. Now, something Yuho and others may not have considered that we think is a great option for a grade school gaming event is an RPG. Mm -hmm. A one-hour RPG session is probably the perfect length for most younger kids, and if it's a regular event, you have the option of running an ongoing campaign dealing with a new situation each week. Mm -hmm. This is also a great format to slowly introduce a more complicated RPG by adding in rules each week. So the first RPG I taught my kids is still my favorite for introducing kids to RPGs, and that is Mermaid Adventures. Not only does this have a super family-friendly theme with the whole undersea theme and various different types of mermaids and focus on things like the Mermaid Olympics and trying to find the lost pearl, it is really dead simple system just using white and black d6s for success failure collect white dice for the things you're good at the gm gives you black dice for your complications you roll some dice they cancel each other out and see if you succeed really simple the problem with mermaid adventures is finding a copy of the original printing so mermaid adventures was originally released as a standalone rpg with this simple system sadly third eye games re-released it as a supplement for their PIP core system, which I honestly found wasn't very kid-friendly at all. Now you could still use that, but you're gonna need to pick up two books for one, and then you're gonna have to simplify the rules. So if you can find it, find the original printing of Mermaid Adventures, which is a standalone game. And I do feel bad because everything else on this list, I double checked and made sure it was in print and available, but I can't help but recommend this game because it works so great with my kids. And that was Mermaid Adventures the original printing. Yes. Now, when you talk about role-playing, at least today in 2021, everyone knows about Dungeons and Dragons. It's pretty much ubiquitous now. It's almost at the point where you can walk into a toy store and buy action figures again. This game is arguably more popular than ever now. And there's a good chance some kids in your school, especially those showing up to a gaming event, are probably critters and into critical role or watch their favorite streamers play D&D as it is. Now, Adventure Begins is a great high improv way to get kids into some of the core concepts of Dungeons and Dragons, like rolling a d20 die to attack and hit points and showing off some of the unique creatures of the world, like beholders and dragons. This was a huge hit in my own household, as well as at my kids' grade school. So this is one that I have firsthand knowledge worked great in a one hour after school game setting. Only thing to watch for is production issues from Hasbro. And that was D&D Adventure Begins. Finally, I have Magical Kitty Save the Day, which I couldn't decide if I wanted to highlight this one or one of the other games that Sean's going to mention in a little bit, but I decided to settle on this because of the premise. What kid doesn't want to play a magical cat trying to solve their people's problems? Added to that, the system is quick, easy to learn, and play as a player. Like, it's honestly very similar to Mermaid Adventures, where you're grabbing a pool of dice based on what you can do. The difference is there's no opponent dice in this one. You're just trying to beat a difficulty number. The problem is with Magical Kitty Save the Day, which you can read about in my full review, is on the person running the game, the game master. Well, this is a great game to introduce kids to RPGs. It is not a great game for someone who's never run an RPG before to try to pick up and start running. Now, once you run the one-shot library adventure in the back of the book, which I will say is fantastic, you're basically on your own to keep the kids coming back after that. And their system for creating adventures requires a lot of prep work. Now, that said, if you are the type of person who has the time to do that work and maybe get some of the kids to help you out, I think you could keep kids interested in Magical Kitties for a long time. And that was Magical Kitties Save the Day. Other, uh, sorry, we have Hero Kids, No Thank You Evil, Happy Birthday Robot, Little Wizards, and, well, Dungeons and Dragons. There's no reason you couldn't dive right in. So in my kids' grade school, the older kids actually just played full-on D&D because as a player, you don't need to know all the stuff. It's very easy for a DM to let you just tell them what you want to do and come up with a ruling for it and tell you what the, what the roll this, roll that. Yes, you made it. 
D and D as a player can be that dead simple. And that's it for our tips for running a grade school board game event and some game suggestions for running one. Remember, if you've got a game or game night question for us, head over to the website and click on Ask the Bellhop. Now let's head over to the lobby and see if they have anything to add. So I did see uh, a little bit of chatter happening here in the uh, thing. What do we got here? Uh, first so of there, all, there uh, is quite a bit, yeah. but it goes further up. So while you're going to look at that, so Math Guy Dave is in our chat room, but he did contact us ahead of time because he, he almost forgot okay. we were recording today. Dang, uh, four day weekends through through people, three day weekends. I don't even know. How, this shows I work from home. I don't even know how many days a normal weekend is. Was a four day weekend or a three day weekend? I think it was four in the states and three here, depending on 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 your holiday. Whatever got thrown off. Didn't realize we were recording tonight, but did join us. So games he suggested was Suspicion, Math Dice Junior, Telestrations, which we had, Dragonwood, which is one I've been curious about. I've wanted to play Labyrinth, which I assume is the Magic Labyrinth, the amazing Magic Labyrinth from Ravensburger, which I almost put on the list. Very solid game. Quirkle, which we had, Magic Labyrinth, which we had, and Werewolf werewolf it's my personal bias i don't know do we want to teach a bunch of kids to lie to each other we i'm not sure on that one yeah, we don't like that game so uh we'll, i, I we'll, am not sure on that we'll one. let other people uh make that decision uh so razul in the chat room said co-op games are great as long as you can avoid the alpha gaming and yes. that is definitely something and, and one of the reasons why you you can't just you know give these kids and uh a game and and walk away over to another yeah. table there does need to be some supervision to avoid things like that and to or to you know to to help the kids who are getting you know run over if, if one kid is trending yes. in that direction yeah the whole thing like i talked about having the kids play in teams you've got to make sure that it's a team that that you are letting the the youngest members the quietest members get their their voice heard and making decisions so it's not just one member of that team that decides everything right um what else have we got here uh Math guy Dave, as a teacher, was laughing at your idea of an educator budget. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Some um, yeah. publishers are willing to work with schools. Yep. Many publishers. I don't know if the publishers who make Pitch Car are willing to work with schools, but actually they should. They make historical games that have teacher's editions. They, they are the ones that do um, um, Freedom the Underground Railroad and that. They are the same com company that publishes uh, Pitch Car. So Eagle Griffin Games does have educational versions of games. So now more high school level, like these are these aren't the kind of games and topics you're going to talk about, but they may be worth reaching out to for something like Pitch Car. Uh, Dimension could be good for this, which was... Uh, which... Uh, that is one I've not tried. I've shared deals of it, but it does seem like it would be a good kids game. It's not one I have personally played. It has to do with stacking balls, trying to mat match patterns. It's a Cosmos game. Right. Uh, and uh, and Math Guy Dave jumped in even before you did, talking about custom word lists yes. for telestrations. Yeah, uh, that's exactly absolutely. where I would go right away. Uh, so um, Set is one that Courtney has mentioned. Set is a great game. I played that in high school, though the reason we played it in high school is we were taking a Turing programming course and someone was trying to program it in Turing. And I actually produced a very awesome version of Set that he was going to try to sell, but unfortunately ran into licensing issues. The, whoever owned set was not willing to buy his software or let them use his name so right but that was really well done and he mentioned the pokemon trading card game i personally would probably keep ccgs out you don't want kids showing up for the first time playing those games and going home and begging their kids to buy booster packs like and that's most, a personal opinion but... most schools have have banned like all, any all of my kids grade schools eventually at some point banned pokemon uh yeah. because of a lot one of the big problems is uh, older kids taking advantage of younger kids and saying hey you want this pretty card for that one and yes. that one is actually a valuable card or something so yes definitely uh digital gaming uh fair but i don't want to talk about those tonight <laughs> we're, we're talking about in-person gaming for a change we talked a lot about digital gaming uh razul mentions that the marvel uh versions of uh uh, code, names? code names can be tough if you're not a huge marvel yeah exactly fan. that's that's why i didn't i'm mentioning it as it exists so if you happen to have a group of kids that are all talking mcu all the time it might be the perfect game for them so razul mentions munchkin but then dave our teacher steps yeah. in and says might not be great in a classroom yeah i i personally would be avoiding take that games anything where you're where you're you're, you're stabbing another player in the back could easily lead to hard feelings right hurt feelings not hard feel well possibly hard feelings too 
And for a middle school, a little older than we're talking here, but Math Guy Dave has run DCC Funnel. Oh, there you go. But same thing, like almost, to be honest, almost every role-playing game is a player. Like I'm not trying to downgrade players. And yes, there is such a thing as player skill and system mastery and being good at a role-playing game. But pretty much every role-playing game is you, the DM presenting a situation, you going, this is how I react to it, and the DM telling you what to do. So like almost all of them are perfect for kids in a way. Because I just tell you what you need to roll stuff. Take the gold sounds like a good one, which has corgis and kitties on it. It's not one I know myself, but that sounds like it could be good. That comes from tech. Um, King of Tokyo is kind of the same way. See, King of Tokyo is, you know, it has some take that, but it's more, it's you hit everyone. It's one of the things I like about King of Tokyo is every fist you roll while you're in Tokyo hits everyone. So you're not really centering anyone out. And yes, you attack the person in Tokyo, but it's King of the Hill. Like, I, 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 it's very hard for favoritism to play a role in King of Tokyo, where in Munchkin, it can. If there's the kid that they pick on in the schoolyard, they can now pick on them in a game atmosphere. And you don't want that. You want to avoid that at all costs. That's where I think King of Tokyo beats out games like Munchkin. Splendor could be good. I, I agree. Any of those like simple engine builders. Again, you're working on low player counts. That's my only disadvantage. I can really see with Splendor. Mm. Yeah, DCC works great for huge groups. That's yeah. totally fair. All right, I think we're good. Yeah, I think we're... Uh... Thank you, everyone in the chat, as always, for tossing out those awesome ideas. I always love it when they're like one step ahead or behind us. Like one of the two, either yeah. I say something and I see someone put it in the chat or I see them put it in the chat and I'm about to say it. That always makes me feel good. I love seeing that. We doing this? Yeah. Yep. All right. Remember, if you got a game or game night question for us, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop or fire off an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com.